I've really been praying all week. It's just been on my heart that God would open your hearts to receive the word of God today and to uh, take something home with you today to encourage you to apply to your life. When Pastor Ron and I got married, it wasn't long after that that we started being asked to preach in different parts of the country and overseas. And uh, it was a little bit of a problem for me because I had a fly. And uh, I really was really anxious about flying. I, I had so much fear. And uh, there was a couple things. First, I kept thinking, how does something that big and weighs that much with that many people fly over an ocean for that many hours and never fall out of the sky? I mean, it just didn't make sense to me. And I was, re <laughs> yeah, I was really plagued with that. I mean, I just had this fear. It was terrible. And then on top of it, what about the turbulence? You know, you get up in the sky and, okay, phew, finally I'm up, I'm looking out, we didn't crash, okay, come on, this is good, we, you know, we're flying. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you hit these humongous potholes. That's what it felt like anyways. I'm thinking, what are we hitting? We're in the sky. I mean, what could we possibly, I'm looking out the window, and, you know, you'd hear, this is, your captain. this is your captain speaking. I have just put on the fasten your seatbelts. Please get in your seats and fasten your seatbelt. And oh my gosh, my nerves would go blur. And uh, I started wearing these headphones so I could block out all the noise. And I'd blast Christian music. I'd be worshiping the Lord. And uh, all of a sudden, I would hear someone speaking. I'd go, what would they say? What would they say? And of course, my husband is the encourager he is. And he looked at me and he said, don't worry. It'll be over soon. I'll see you in heaven. And I was like, are you kidding me? And, um, you know, he just would go on and on. But I really had to work at overcoming fear. I really did. And I'm going to share a little bit more about how I practically how I did that in a little bit. But, you know, something I learned, I learned that turbulence was very normal. It was really part of the process. In order for me to get to my destination... I had to fly certain heights, and then I had to go through turbulence. Turbulence was just the normal part of the journey. I was going to face it. And sometimes that turbulence was absolutely horrible as you went through storms. Sometimes it was just little turbulence bouncing you around. But it was normal. It was part of the process. And then another thing I realized was that these planes were built so sturdy. In fact, uh, a retired Delta airline captain said, they are they're so solid, they are made to withstand turbulence. They have extreme safety standards. And if you look at um, statistics, turbulence is not something that takes a plane down. It just isn't. In fact, it's been four decades or something before you ever heard that turbulence uh, uh, caused a lot of harm. But there is something on our part that we need to do when we're in turbulence. You see, the pilot, the captain, the architect the, who designed it, they all did their part. They made this sturdy plane that can withstand extreme turbulence. And they, the, the pilot is trained, they're dr flying this plane, knows where he's going or she's going. But there's a part we have to play. And that part is fasten up your seatbelts. Why? Because if you're not, and you get in very rough turbulence, you can get hurt. You need to be secure. You need to be sound. You need to be seated. And that seatbelt needs to be on. Well, what causes turbulence? Turbulence is actually caused by um, crossing a barrier between different currents. Okay, so you got these um, different air currents, and when you go across them, it causes it to shake. I mean, it really does. If you had your eyes closed you would almost feel like you're hitting these uh, huge potholes and you're just uh, bouncing all over the place. But you're actually coming into a different current. And like I said, some are really strong, some aren't that strong, but it shakes the plane up. But in order for us to fly to our destination, listen to me, you have to go through turbulence. You will never fly to the height that you have to fly to in order to get to your destination if you're afraid of turbulence. There was this uh, 
an African philosopher, I happened to read this, it said, a bird that fears turbulence will never know how high it can fly. You know, bir birds, do they really fear for turbulence? I mean, God made them to fly. But the truth of the matter is, if we fear turbulence, and if we fear turbulence in our lives, we will never go forward to where God wants us to be. Think of an architect. I was thinking about this with the skyscrapers. You know, architects, when they design a skyscraper, they take into account all the stress, all the pressure. They know the weight of the whole, every floor. They know the kind of beams they have to put in it. They know how deep the foundation has to go. They make it so it can withstand stress. And guess what? Skyscrapers do get under a lot of stress. And here's the problem I see that most architects, well, all architects on this earth, they're human beings, and they can make a mistake. And we trust in them that they've been trained and they know what they're doing. But I have some really good news for you today. The architect that designed you, that made you, he's perfect, and he never makes a mistake. Come on, he's perfect and never makes a mistake. He is the God most high. He is the one who has designed the solar system, the universe. He is the one that keeps all the planets in orbit. They don't never go out of order, orbit. He is the one that made the sun and the moon and the stars and the bugs on the earth. I've got to ask you about that one. The, uh, the animals, the gorgeous animals, human beings. He's the one who designed us. He is perfect. He never makes a mistake. He is our architect. He's the one who did it. See, when he laid out your life, he had a plan. He calculated everything that you would face in your life. All the pressure, the elements. He even knew that you were going to go through this pandemic. He even knew that some were going to get COVID and what was going to happen. He knew it from the foundations of the earth. And when he laid his plan out for your life, he took into account every one of your hurts you were going to face. He took into account all the injustice that you were going to receive. He took into account the loss of loved ones that was going to be in your life. He took into account all your weaknesses and the mistakes that you were going to make in your life. And he made you th with thick beams. He made made you with a firm foundation. He made a deep foundation so you could withstand anything that came your way. That's the God who made us. That's the God we serve. He is powerful. Now listen, he has put strength in you. He has put tenacity in you. He has put fortitude in you. He put it in you. Why? It's because he knew from the foundations of the earth that you were going to face what you're facing today. And all of us face turbulence. All of us face opposition. We all face injustice. We all face loss. He knew that. He knew that right from the very beginning. And he made you to be an overcomer and to be victorious. In fact, the Bible says to us, he has a plan for our lives not to hurt us, not to harm us, but for good and for success. That is the God we serve. And that is the God who made you, and who made me. But there's one requirement. He says, I will do my part, now you do yours. Get your seatbelts on. Fasten your seatbelts. That's what he tells you to do. And this morning, I've got three thoughts that are the seatbelts that will keep us securely fastened. Number one, I want you to get a revelation that God's DNA lives in us. He lives in you. Listen to the scripture. Psalm 139, 13. God made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Do you realize that the moment of conception, and that's a big debate out there today, but the moment you were conceived... That God was at work in you, taking the delicate inner parts of your body, knitting them together, and making you into the person you are today. 
Do you realize it happened the second you were conceived, that he saw what your life was? In fact, he knew it before you were even conceived. And he began at that moment to make you the person you are today. It was not a mistake. He made you who you are today. But then in Genesis, it says this. God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Do you understand that God made you? That he put in you his DNA? Everything that is in God was put in us so we could be the men and women of God that he's called us to be. That is a powerful thought. When God made man, he made Adam and Eve, okay? And when he created man, he put in them an unshakable, undefeated DNA to help them to ascend the barriers between different currents that they would face. Now, Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world. When he put them in the garden, they were really, in reality, they weren't perfect. He gave them a free will. Obviously, they sinned. But he put them in a perfect world. I don't think they had to face too much turbulence or trials. And I'm not really sure how long they were there before they sinned and went against God's will. But eventually, they did. They ate of the fruit. They were tricked by the devil and lied to them that they were going to be these better than God, all the knowledge that God had. And they ate the forbidden fruit to come to find out that the devil was nothing but a liar. And now they broke fellowship with the one who created them. Do you realize they walked and talked with God every day? Can you imagine that, what that world was like? The lions and tigers are friendly. I can't wait. I love animals. But I don't think there was turbulence. There was nothing going on. But when sin entered the world, now they were cut off from that close fellowship with the God who made them. And there was a problem now. They weren't in a perfect world anymore turbulence and trials and tribulations came into the world that they had to face. And God understood. He says, we got, a pro- we got a problem here. Man has just gotten cut off from me. And my desire has been to have a personal, energizing relationship in, with one and with man. That's what he wanted. So he had a plan. He sent his son, Jesus. Jesus, who is God, came to earth as man He died on the cross. He took every sin that man has ever committed on him so that you and I, when we come to that place to accept Christ in our lives, we are cleansed from that sin, and we once again have fellowship with God. We become one in him. In fact, Paul, uh, uh, throughout his writings, he, he uses the phrase, in Christ. You see, we are in Christ. Christ. Jesus lives within us. The Spirit of God lives within us. And we have the DNA of God in us. We have that same power, that same characteristics that now live in us through the blood of Jesus Christ who died upon the cross for you and I. In order for us to walk the Christian life, in order for us to be overcomers, in order for us to fly to heights that we never could imagine we could get to, we have to understand who we are in Christ. That's big. That is not an easy thing to understand. We need to begin to understand that when we're in the turbulence of sickness, his DNA of healing is available to us. When we're in the the, uh, turbulence of sadness and grief, his DNA of joy is available to us. One of the seatbelts and security that we have got to begin to understand and have a revelation for is that who we are in Christ. I often ask myself the question, what makes the difference between people who rise above, go to heights, and accomplish amazing things versus people who tend to live their life every day under this turbulence, this, this disappointment, this discouragement all the time. I really have to believe it's getting that revelation of who we are in Christ. People who understand who they are, 
that what is available to them through Jesus Christ can rise above the turbulence and become all that God has called them to be. So when we face times of turbulence, what do we do? We need to regain our footing and keep our focus on who we are in Christ. When I was flying one time, um, hey, I got to get up and use the restroom. So I get up, you know, you got to crawl over all the people. You get out there, and I'm not exactly small. And, you know, you get out in the aisle, you walk down, you wait. I no sooner get into these tiny little bathrooms that I could barely fit in, and I'm looking for, you know, where's this, where's that? You got to find all the little things all compacted in there. And all of a sudden, ladies and gentlemen, the captain has just put on your seatbelt, a uh, seatbelt sign. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm in the bathroom. Whoa, whoa. And all of a sudden, I'll never forget this, the plane just starts to, and I am like, oh, no, this can't be happening to me. So I get out, and I'm walking down the aisle, and guess what I realized? I had to regain my footing. I had to be very careful where I was stepping and holding on because it was shaken enough to knock me over, maybe fall in someone's lap or hit my head or whatever. And I had my eye on that seat. I was going to get to it, and I was going to get secure with that seat belt on. You see, when we walk through turbulences of life, we need to get our footing right. And we need to start looking to who we are in Christ, that we are more than conquerors, that we are overcomers, and that this turbulence, even though it's shaking us up, and even though it's causing havoc in our life, we will get through it because we have the DNA of our Father. That's, that's the bottom line. Listen, it's not easy. You know, I stand up here and I preach this, and I think to myself, oh, my gosh, it is not easy to do that when you are going through it. But that is where we have to come to a place in our life and say, I am intentionally going to put one foot in front of the other one, and I'm going to declare who I am in Christ, and I'm going forward, and I am going to get the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, listen to what Paul says in the book of Ephesians. He said, God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. It was, it, 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 do you understand how much God loves you? Do you understand that he wanted to do this for you? We are all sinners. We are not perfect. We shouldn't even be in his presence because he's perfect. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. He loves you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to get you through. He wants to heal you. He wants you to become whole. It goes on to say, so we praise God for his glorious grace that he poured out on us who belong to his dear son. His glorious grace. You know what grace is? It's God favor to those who don't deserve it. He wants to give you his favor. He wants to pour it out on you. He wants you to become all you can be. In fact, Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need, plenty left over to share with others. God will provide everything. You know what that word everything in the Greek means? It means independently wealthy, needing nothing. That's who we are in Christ. That's what we need to begin to claim. Paul went through turbulence. Paul went through some horrible things in his life. In fact, he had a, what they call the thorn in his flesh. I'm not quite sure what it was, but the thing was it really, really bothered him. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. So I'm not defeated by my weakness, but I am delighted. For when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and I face persecution because of my love for Jesus Christ, I am made yet stronger. For my weakness becomes the portal to God's power. When we are going through the turbulence, it is necessary. But remember, it is now a portal for God's power for you. What kind of power? He says it in Ephesians chapter 1, 19. Paul says, and this is my prayer for you today. I've prayed this for you here. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness 
of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. We have God's DNA in me. Let me just share with you a few things the Bible says. The Bible says we're friends of Jesus. We're established. We're anointed. We're sealed. We are bought with the price, and we belong to God. We're chosen. We're appointed to bear fruit. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. We're able to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We're full of peace. We are his workmanship. We're free from condemnation. We're God's child. We're untouchable by the devil. We're the head. We're not the tail. We are above. We're not beneath. Come on. We are overcomers. We are victorious. Our strength is in him. Come on. Give him a little praise here today. We serve an amazing God. He is amazing. And we have that DNA in us. First seatbelt. Number two, the word of God guides us. Here's the other thought. We need to put on the word of God and allow it to guide us. Listen to Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. When you are in times of um, trials, tribulation, turbulence, you have got to know the word of God, and it has got to be your path to guide you. It has to be. Jeremiah 1.12 says, God is watching over his word to fulfill it. Do you realize that? You see, the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is our blueprint. He's the architect. Now he gave us the blueprint. Here it is. If you build according to this, guess what? I'm, I'm here to fulfill it. I'm watching over it. I'm watching you build. I'm making sure every beam's right. I'm making sure the foundation goes deep. I'm watching it. But come on, people, you have to do it. You have to begin to apply that word in your life. It's like a road map. Follow the road map. That's what God wants. Now, here's the thing. A lot of us know the Bible generally. Oh, yeah, that's the Bible says that somewhere. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's, we generally get an idea what the Bible is. Or we know popular verses like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, or Psalm 23. But see, God is calling us to a deeper knowledge of the word of God. He is calling us to begin to take the scriptures, begin to think about them, begin to memorize them, begin to meditate upon them, and begin to apply them to our lives. When I am going through a horrible time, I have learned that if I find a scripture that applies to it, I need to begin to actually speak it out loud over the situation. Now here, let me just give you a couple examples. Flying. I'm telling you, a week or two before I flew, I can't tell you the anxiety I had. I, I would just break out in sweats. I think I'm not doing this. I can't get on this plane. God, why, why, why are you making me fly there to minister? I mean, come on. You know, I, I, it was ridiculous. And I would take scriptures like, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power, might, and a self-control or sound mind. And I would just say, fear, you got to go. And I would speak it out loud. And I would say, God isn't giving me this spirit of fear. Where are you coming from, devil? No, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but power might sound mine. I would start saying, Philippians, be anxious in nothing, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you, Father. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I begin to praise him. And it says, um, be anxious in nothing, but through prayer and supplications, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. That surpasses all understanding. Well, guard your heart and mind. And I would say, okay, God, I need peace. I can't do this. I just cannot do this. you got to give me your peace. And sure enough, God would come and give me his peace. It was another time I just came to know Christ. And um, I played uh, sports in college. And I had fallen playing basketball. And I really hurt my knee. It was killing me. I, I just every day it was just this throbbing. I'd go to bed and I'd throb. I, I, nothing relieved it. And um, I went to church, and I was a new Christian, and they had a teaching about speaking the word. So I went to the Bible, and I got out scriptures like, by his stripes I am healed, and perfect love, um, I mean, his, he sent his word, and he healed me. And I began to literally take, take what I heard and apply it. And I'd be walking, 
In Jesus, and once I was in the grocery store, Jesus' name, I'm telling you, you need to obey the word of God. By his stripes, I'm healed. And I look up, and these people are looking at me. Okay, loony tune, you know. But um, I did. And I went day after day after day after day. And the next thing I know, I woke up, pain gone, back on playing basketball, no problem. God's word we have available for us is absolutely amazing. i got to give you this testimony. Um, as you know, Pastor Jonathan, who is my son, he and his, uh, my daughter-in-law, Nikki, are on vacation. And uh, they called us up and said that J.J. had got a, gotten this infection and he needed to go to the urgent care. So um, this is what uh, Jonathan told me. He said, J.J. heard that he had to go to the doctors. And they said, all of a sudden, with no prompting, with not saying anything, we didn't pray, we didn't do anything, J.J. starts walking around and he's whispering, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be courageous. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. God is with you wherever you go. And he was just, they said they were watching him, and they're like, what? He's walking around. Don't be afraid. Be strong. Be courageous. God is with you. And he just keeps repeating this over and over. And then Nikki realized, wait a minute, this is his scripture verse for the month at preschool. He goes to a Christian preschool. And just out of nowhere, he just began to quote it. He was so peaceful. He was so calm. They went to the doctors. They took care of it. He's better. You know, from the mouth of babes, that's what the Bible says. Jesus said they came to sit on his lap, the children. He said, be as little children. He said, unless you're like a child, you would not enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because we analyze everything. We think so much. We have so much knowledge. All J.J. knew was he was told, you call out on God, he's going to help you. And he just started quoting those scriptures. No one told him to. No one told him to do that. Speaking the word of God is powerful. The Bible says in Romans 10, 7, faith comes by hearing the word of God. You know what? When you speak it, you hear it. And faith comes. And we need faith to overcome the turbulence that we face. If you are on the path of fear, you just start speaking that word because he wants you on the path of peace. If you are on the path of sorrow and grief, you just start speaking that word because he wants you on the path of joy. That is the God that we serve. Proverbs 18, 12, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Do you know what that's saying? It's saying what we say will influence what we have in our lives. What you are speaking out loud to others. Listen, there is craziness going on in the world today. I have to be honest, the news, I watch the news, I don't care what news station it is, the fear just comes on you. And what we do is we go around speaking that and all this and that and all that and we get so worked up. Let me tell you something, the word of God has got to be stronger in you than what is happening in this world around you. Take more time to read the word, to meditate upon it. Jesus, um, in Hebrews 1.3, Paul says, Jesus upholds all things by the power of his word. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Come on, it's alive. Do you understand that Jesus created the whole world by speaking? It was his word, and it created the world. You have the same power because Christ lives in you. Isaiah 55, 11, God said, so shall my word be which goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me void. It will not be useless without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter of which I sent it. Listen, we need to speak the word. Joshua 1, 8, God commands. He said way back in the, in the Old Testament, he goes, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your pro it will make you prosperous, ways prosperous, and you will have good success. You want success? Start speaking the word of God. Apply it to your situation. As we are created in God's image, we need to be actively and continuously speaking and praying his word in our lives and in every situation we find ourselves in. Okay, seatbelt number three. The Holy Spirit is our helper. When Jesus left, Jesus was physically here on earth. 
He was God, but he was man. But he knew there was a time he was going to leave. And he told his disciples, he said, you wait here. And he says in John 14, 16, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper or an, or an advocate, an encourager, a counselor, that he may be with you forever. We have this Holy Spirit that's living within us. He is our 24-7 helper. Anytime. You need him, he's there. In fact, I just want to encourage you, if, if, you, if you're able to come, my husband's teaching the Holy Spirit class on Tuesday nights at, at 6.30, and we have four more weeks. Really, we're learning about the person. We're understanding his person, his presence, and his power. This past week, we learned that he's not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is alive, and he lives within us. See, when we come to know Christ, he comes and he dwells within us. But then there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk about in the class and pray for everybody. But there also is this thing that we need to continually ask to be filled with the Spirit. I just want to give you an example before I close. Um, Peter and um, John were arrested because they were uh, praying for the sick and got healed and preaching the gospel. And before they were released, they warned them. They said, listen to me, you preach this anymore, you're going back to prison. I mean, it was the same Jewish leaders that crucified Jesus. So Peter and John, they go back to, to um, all the disciples, and it says in Acts 4.31, they all prayed together, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. That is so powerful. If you go through the book of Acts, you will see continually they asked to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, before this happened, when John and Peter stood before all the leaders, they were saying, by what power and what name have you done this? They were just really accusing them. And it says that Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and he began to witness to them. You see, the Holy Spirit is here to fill us and to guide us. In fact, Acts 17, 28 says, for in him we live, we move, and we have our being. There is nothing we can do without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need him to ascend to heights and be the victorious Christians God has called us to be. All we got to do is ask. Jesus says in Luke eleven thirteen, 13, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask. Listen, all we have to do is ask. We need to get our seatbelts on. I'm going to ask the worship man to come up as I close. Listen, turbulence is necessary for us to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. You are not going to go through this life without turbulence. Whether you accept Christ or you don't, you're going to face it. It's necessary in life. But God has created us to withstand it, and God has created us to fly to new heights and get through it. That is our God. It's necessary. It builds character. It builds strength. It gives us perseverance. Even, you know, even Jesus acknowledged the fact that you're going to have trials. He said, he said to them, um, you're going to face trials and tribulation, but you know what? Be of good courage because I've overcome the world. That's, that's the God we serve. And so I'm going to challenge you today. I want you to make it a choice. Will you be intentional today to begin to read the word and find out who you are in Christ? Don't let the devil lie to you that you're no good, that you just, it was an accident, you came, and look, at you can do nothing. I know there's many people that need healing and, and from abuse and different things that happen in life, but listen to me. Read the word. Begin to declare it out loud in your situation. Begin to put those seatbelts on. Begin to ask every day, Holy Spirit, come fill me afresh. He wants to give you the grace. He wants to give you the strength to be the overcome he's called you to be. Let me just read this scripture in closing. Isaiah 50 uh, verse 7 says this, because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a stone. And that's what I'm asking you guys to do today. Take the challenge. You know what? 
Turn off the news. Turn off the TV. Read the word. You know, I, I'm just telling you, I, I, I don't, I, it, I can't watch a lot of stuff anymore. It just makes me so uptight. It makes me, like, nervous and fearful. God's not called us to that. Spend time into the word. Set your face like a stone. Determined to do his will. Will you be determined today to do his will? And I know that I will not be put to shame or I will be successful. God wants to make you overcomers. God wants to make you successful. God wants to help you get through the turbulence. Let's just stand our feet as I pray for you. Father, I thank you for those who are here today. I thank you for those who are watching. Oh, God, I pray that you would help us all. I pray, Holy Spirit, right now that you would come. As each individual says yes to you, I pray there would just be a fresh outpouring of your spirit right now upon every one of them, giving them the grace, that great favor you have for us to be overcomers. I pray today that the desire to read your word, the desire to declare your word, the desire to, to know who they are in Christ would just burn in them today. Holy Spirit, don't, don't let them go without getting that desire to do those things. And Holy Spirit, I pray today for a revelation. There are many who are sitting here, uh, sitting out here and really are maybe at your home watching this. And you're saying, I don't get it. I really just don't get it. Lord, I'm asking you today, because I was there at one time, give them a revelation. As they open up their heart and say, okay, I'm willing to get a revelation, I pray that you would show them today their need for you, their need for salvation, and that what you want to do in their lives. Lord, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for these people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.